Once upon a time, long ago, Valder, king of the Acer, ruled over his fellow Acer with kindness and justice. He was beloved by all, and all was good. But one day, the terrible Prince Lindworm came down and struck Valder, ending his reign forever. Both Acer and Dragons were greatly upset by this heartless crime and joined together to seal away the terrible Prince Lindworm forever in an iron tomb. With the evil defeated, both parties joined hand in hand to become what is now known as the Court of the Fae. But Prince Lindworm isn't truly gone. He still sleeps deep beneath the earth, and every 100 years a chosen hero must go and reseal his tomb. For if not, he will surely break free from his prison and bring on the end of the world. There is hope, however, that one day King Valder will return again and defeat the terrible Prince Lindworm once and for all. Yes, this is a story that has been shared throughout the ages, and it, like with most other stories, it can be sourced from a kernel of truth. But what was that truth, and what is merely a fairy tale? Hi, it's me, Gat, but you can also call me Gatsby. And ever since, well, I was alive, I've loved fairy tales. Like a lot of kids, I was exposed to them first uh, via Disney's Renaissance era of films, mainly Beauty and the Beast in my case. But as I gained the ability to read, I found myself drawn to the various fairy tale collections my Mima owned, and in some cases gifted to me. The overlapping tropes and themes not being a bore to me, but a source of fascination. How stories can be shared with each other and retold and reshaped and told once again and inspiring even more stories. Heck, here's some certified Gatskin lore for you all. My username is literally just a portmanteau of my name, Gatsby, combined with Catskin, a lesser known fairy tale. But I added a extra T so I could have consistent spelling across social media sites. Yes, I've always loved fairy tales. And it's because of that love that I want to tell you about a fairy tale of my own creation. An original story that's been cooking in my brain for years. Now, with some of the characters in this story I made almost a decade ago at the time of me recording this. So, without further ado, let me show you a cast of characters I've designed based off of fairy tales and the story that they all exist in, Thunder Puppet. First things first, yes, I know Thunder Puppet sounds kind of stupid as a title, but I never came up with anything better, so here we are now. And secondly, since I have this uh, footage of me doing a rough lineup of all the characters I'll be drawing today. I lost that footage. So just take some footage of me drawing the characters in today's video together. Now would be a perfect time to kind of give a quick rundown on this story and like the vibes it has, if that makes sense. Like I said, this is a story inspired by fairy tales, but also shows like Princess Tutu, Big O, Jim Henson's The Storyteller, and movies uh, from Studio Ghibli, specifically Kiki's Delivery Service and Howl's Moving Castle. And maybe just a little bit of a revolutionary girl, Utena, among other things. Thunder Puppet takes place in a fantasy fairy tale world that technologically and aesthetically is somewhere around the 1920s, early 30s. And a lot of that aesthetic inspiration coming from the Art Deco and Art Nouveau movements. The setting is a capital city of a small country, and the city goes by the name of East of Sun, West of Moon which is in of itself taken from a title of a fairy tale. And yes, that also does sound silly, but if Shrek can have far, far away, I can use East of Sun, West of Moon. Though it is a bit of a mouthful to say. So if I ever say like Eos for short, I mean East of Sun, West of Moon. And in Eos, a grand event is happening. The current King Heinrich von Blue 
is retiring. He's stepping down as king, and his daughter, uh, the princess, is being coronated in a few days. So the princess is super busy, and so are her three closest servants, uh, her royal retainers, whatever you want to call them. And they are tasked with taking care of anything that could possibly go wrong, possibly interfere with uh, this event. One such event is that a strange group of animals has been reported running around causing mischief and havoc across the city. This being a horse, a dog, a lizard, and a raven. So they have to catch and take care of these animals. But that's just the tip of the iceberg as more and more events and strange going-ons continue on in the background. With rumors swirling about that the king uh, secretly transported some mysterious package to the capital weeks prior and that with the chaos of the coronation going on there's a lot of tension and magic in the air. Pretty much anything can happen. So with that baseline explanation out of the way uh, let's get on to our cast of characters. Starting off with our first guy, uh, Damien here. You know how a lot of people will have like a fictional character from like a show or game or whatever? And said character is a fully grown man with like eye bags and like student loan debt or something. And they call him, they still call him like, oh, that's my baby girl. Damien's my baby girl. Okay, he, he's my baby girl. <laughs> he's my little Zuzu pet that I, I shake around in my brain for enrichment when I'm in needing of enrichment. And in the story of Thunder Puppet, he definitely gets shaken around uh, quite a bit, let me tell you. So Damien Sturm, he works as basically the right-hand man, advisor, secretary, retainer, whatever you want to call it to the crown princess, Shinju Von Blue. And he takes his job very seriously because he kind of owes his life to the royal family. A few years ago, east of sun, west of moon, experienced this incredibly intense, severe thunderstorm. And it was during this pouring rain that a man appeared on the castle's doorstep. And he was just in this terrible state, emaciated, his clothes, and was just in this terrible state. He was just very disheveled looking, clothes in a ragged state, just a soggy looking piece of work. And the royal family took him in, gave him a place to sleep for the night. And when the clouds parted the next day and this mystery man, you know, came to woke up, he realized he had no knowledge of his name or where he came from. So the king gave him the name, Damien Sturm, and gave him a job of working for Shinju and ever since then he has done just that and never really has he wanted for much else even after all this time not even daring to think about what uh, life he had beforehand so he's extremely devoted to his job um, out of loyalty and specifically to Shinju because she was definitely the one who really uh, kind of showed him the rope, showed him around. And I'll get more into it when I get to her segment. But Damien knows that he needs to stay around. Um, not only because he owes, in his mind, he feels like he owes Shinju a lot. And it's the least he could do. But he knows that if he ever left, you know, to do his own thing, then Shinju would be all alone in the world with no friends. And she would just be incredibly miserable. So he has this feeling of obligation to stay around and do what he's doing now, even if that's something he's not really enjoying. And he has this feeling nagging at him in the back of his mind that something isn't right. He's forgetting something. But he doesn't really want to think about that feeling either, because if he thinks about that feeling in the back of his mind, it just gives him this uh, feeling of dread. He doesn't want to think about his past. So that's another reason why he's so dedicated to his job. It's a way to keep him from thinking about things. Just stay in the moment, focus on the task at hand. And, you know, all that stress from all that work and, you know, 
being the crown princess's secretary right hand man advisor guy he gets so stressed and he has trouble sleeping and you know at night when he has this trouble sleeping and shinju being just this paragon of kindness that she is uh, gives him this medicine this tea that helps him sleep at night it helps him sleep just so deeply and he wakes up and he is really able to just kind of zone out and focus on his job serving the royal family he's do he does what he's told to do and tries not to think for himself and even though deep down he knows he's suffering in this position he also feels like this feeling of guilt of shame is what he deserves he deserves to feel miserable <laughs> even if he doesn't know why he feels like he deserves to feel like that and you might be okay well that's interesting this guy has a lot of issues but how is this a fairy tale character how does this relate to fairy tales and to that i say good question and rather than being based on a specific fairy tale figure Damien is based off of, I guess, a trope, um, a character archetype, and that is the love interest in a, like, true bride-like fairy tales. And those type of fairy tales, they aren't as popular in mainstream media, but basically uh, there's this male love interest to the, the female protagonist, right? And the female protagonist, she goofs up some way, somehow, and the... The guy gets whisked away to some witch or troll or whatever. And he's put under the spell or has to drink some tonic that keeps him in a state where he's like in a limbo mentally and isn't really aware of what's going on around him, if that makes sense. So yeah, that's kind of what I'm, I'm pulling on for Damien. It's a little bit out there, but uh, that and with uh, some other inspirations I can't really get into for time reasons, because I kind of want to make Thunder Puppet a comic one day, so I'm trying to keep things vague enough, so not to spoil my own story here. But yeah, that's uh, that's pretty much it for our boy Damien. He's a very miserable grown man, and I want to shake him in a hamster ball and see him crumple on the ground, but in a loving way. So here we have Her Royal Highness Princess Shinju Von Blue. Shinju is a complicated character. I think the best way to start off explaining Shinju and her whole entire deal is explaining what exactly fairy tale characters and tropes she's based on. The most prominent one is that of the false bride in the true bride type fairy tales. You know, that evil witch or princess or ogress or troll or whoever that is for whatever reason keeping that male love interest away from the female protagonist. Kind of like how I was explaining in Damien's segment previously with Shinju being one of the reasons why uh, Damien feels like he needs to stay in his current position even though deep down uh, his job and working you know for the royal family uh, makes him very miserable and look i know with what i have said so far shinju seems like kind of horrendous that like oh she's just so s selfish she's keeping this guy here in this job in this role against his will and while yes uh, shinju does some kind of sus things and she can definitely come off as annoying and grating and very passionate, very extroverted to the point where it's like, okay, we get it, you're a bit too much. A lot of how she acts and a lot of her actions come from a place of desperation. I'm not saying she's innocent, just she's a product of her upbringing. And what would that be, you might ask? I mean, she's a crown princess born into the lap of luxury. She probably didn't really have to deal with anything that bad in her life. And you're right about that, uh, <laughs> at least with the lap of luxury point. What I want to bring up now is kind of where her other 
inspiration, fairy tale inspiration comes in, and that is that of Bluebeard. Yes, that Bluebeard, the one who was ending the lives of all his wives and had the beard that was blue, you know, Vaughn blue, her hair's blue. But don't worry, Shinju's not a murderer or anything. It's kind of like an ever after high situation where, like an ever after high situation where that blue beard is one of uh, Shinju's ancestors and her whole entire bloodline, including great, great, however many great old blue beard, <laughs> her whole entire family on her father's side, they have this curse where every you know, member of the Von Blue family, every relationship they could possibly ever have never lasts l that long. It always ends up on a bad note. For example, you know, Shinju, her mom divorced her dad and left to go back to her home country, leaving her daughter behind. Because of the knowledge of her family's curse, being out there in the world, Shinju never could really make friends growing up. Everyone was just kind of like, you know, the other kids were like, why would we want to hang around you? You're cursed. We're just going to end up like hurt or something. Like, why would we want to be around you if you're cursed? Her father has always been distant, still is very distant. So Shinju has grown up to be this very lonely woman with uh, abandonment issues. So when this guy literally out of nowhere plops on her doorstep with no knowledge about her family's curse or prior history, Shinju sees an op opportunity to finally have an actual connection with someone. And I want to be clear about something. At the beginning of Damien's and Shinju's relationship, it was, it started off good. They had a really good relationship. You know, Shinju was showing him like the ropes around East of sun, west of moon. Damien was, you know, happy. <laughs> All was good. But because of certain factors, that relationship that they once had ended up deteriorating to its current state. And I think one reason for this is that there's a lot of pressure on the two of them that they need to get married, especially on Shinju. You know, her dad is constantly telling her, like, this is your only chance. Someone's ever going to love you. And you need to go ahead and tie the knot with him and have kids because this is the only opportunity you're ever going to have that someone's ever going to love you. So, marry the guy. So, Shinju's been kind of bringing up the idea with Damien, you know, beating around the bush, that kind of thing. Though, if Shinju really sat down and was given the opportuni opportunity to think about what she wanted in life, she would know that. A romantic relationship is not what she wants with Damien. She's just that desperate for any type of companionship and also the approval of others, especially her father. It just ends up all coming together in this toxic way. Yeah, it's a very messy situation. And with Shinju, I definitely worry because she is a complicated character and she's also a woman. And... There's been a lot of cases where it's like people will say they want, oh, we want complicated female characters. And then they get a compl complicated female character and they automatically want to like stone her to death. Think she's the wicked, <laughs> the most evil thing out there. And like I said, Shinju's far from perfect, but she's not evil. She's just desperate. So yeah, there's, there's our good old Shinju Von Blue. Okay, here we are with the next character in today's uh, video, and that is Wrath. And his fairy tale inspiration should be pretty obvious. It's the big bad wolf, you know, huffing and puffing and blowing everybody's house down. But there's more to Wrath than just that one inspiration. Some other fairy tales that inspired me uh, with Wrath's creation were fairy tales like Hans my Hedgehog, and the white wolf. So to kind of summarize what I'm trying to cook here, here's basically like Raph's backstory. So once upon a time, there was this couple and they were farmers, didn't have a lot of money. And they really wanted a child, but they just couldn't have any, just no luck, you know, having a baby. 
And then one day they were like, we don't care what baby we get, even if our kid is as ugly as sin and looks like a monstrous wolf, we just want a baby. And then boom, the wife gets pregnant and they have a son and oh my gosh, whoa, oh, he looks like a wolf. And at first the parents are like, well, this is weird, but this is our little baby son boy and we're gonna care for him because this is the baby that we've always wanted. But as time goes on, the couple grow to resent the baby that they had once longed for. You know, he's not a regular human boy. He acts differently. The rest of the small village they live in, they treat him differently. And then they, and they treat the parents differently because, you know, they had a weird wolf kid. He doesn't fit in with his peers. And... Also, all that shedding with his fur? I mean, come on. So each and every day, uh, Raph's parents kind of start resenting him more and more, and they stop being as good of parents to him. And it's little things at first, but eventually they can only look at their son with feelings of resentment and disgust. So Raph, the poor kid, now a teenager, in this situation, who, mind you, never asked to be born, feels how much his parents and how much everyone in the village he grew up in just hates him, hates his guts. So he packs up his stuff, uh, including his pet chicken, and he leaves. He travels around for a bit, but eventually finds his way to the capital city of East of Sun, West of Moon, and gets hired by the royal family to work as a bodyguard, muscle guy, because, well, he's a wolf guy, and there's some intimidation factor there uh, that's pretty useful to have, having a wolf guy work for you. But another thing that makes him, you know, very useful uh, to his employers is that he possesses a very unique ability to kind of talk and commune with animals. And also, because of this, I like to think Raph, uh, despite... His outwardly very crass, outspoken, rude personality. He is actually a very a soft, loving, gentle, like, animal lover. And probably is a vegetarian. And you just wouldn't think that looking at him. And that's kind of like the point of him. See, he was so used to everyone hating him growing up. He kind of got used to the feeling that no matter what he does people are gonna like look down on him and hate him so he kind of just became like forever the heel you know like the wrestling heel the guy who acts bad and like on purpose to kind of rouse up the audience Raph just forever acts the heel he can't really fathom people actually liking him so he's like okay if I act bad then at least I know that it's because I'm being an asshole and I can control being an asshole. That's something I have control over, if that makes sense. And even when he becomes kind of friends or at least acquaintances with Damien Shinju and the next character I'll be talking about here, Corey, he, for lack of better term, he acts like a tsundere <laughs> around them very you know, rough on the outside, but, you know, he has his sweet moments. But yeah, that's Raph. He's a, he's a funny wolf guy. Well, he's not that funny. If you called him funny, he'd probably, like, be very mad at you, but we are on to the final character employed by the Vaughn Blue Royal family, and that is Cori Bella Benzabel Gory, but everyone just calls her Cori. And you can tell very obviously that Cory, she's not a human. In fact, she's an ogre. And, well, we all know how ogres are often the antagonists in fairy tales, like Puss in Boots, for example. So there's your kinda first fairy tale connection with Cory. I'll explain another one later on. I want to go ahead and say, though, that in the world of Thunder Puppet, being an ogre isn't that big of a deal. Like, sure, they aren't the most common thing to see, but it's not weird. 
like between Corey and Raph, if someone was like walking down the street and saw like the two of them, they'd probably think, oh, neat, an ogre. And then they'd look at Raph and go, oh God, what is that thing? Is that a wolf man? And then they would like probably run away in the opposite direction or something. I don't know. What I do know though, is that in Thunder Puppet, ogres are pretty interesting because pulling from the inspiration of the fairy tale Puss in Boots, where the ogre in that story could shapeshift into animals. All ogres in Thunder Puppet possess some form, some type of shapeshifting. For example, Cory can change the properties of her skin to mimic whatever material she has just touched. And she uses that. She has, I'm thinking steel, but just some kind of like hard metal material on her neck like as a necklace so when she like needs to really give a good wall of thing she just touches that you know makes her punch in hand all nice and metally and gives a good whack in but not the type of whack from the mafia she's she's not involved with the mafia and her late grandfather he could do the animal shape-shifting thing you know like the ogre couldn't puss in boots and here's a little tidbit for you Cory's grandpa actually used to work for King Heinrich before he retired and later passed away. So that is one reason why Cory was hired by the Von Blues. Not only could she be a good bodyguard and also, once again, good muscle, but there was that family connection that definitely added to her credibility. As for her personality, Cory is very nonchalant and does her job because it's her job and she just wants to get paid. And that kind of mentality comes from the fact that that Corey's mother, who although is has a job as a witch and is making money, she's declining in health and a lot of that money being made by both her and her daughter at, you know, Corey's job is getting sent to pay medical bills. So Corey is just like, hey, I just want to get paid so I can take care of my sick mom. But Corey feels a lot of guilt deep down inside because even though she desperately wants to help her mother, you know, pay all these medical bills and whatnot, Corey doesn't like her current job. In fact, what she really wants in life at the moment is to go to college and get a higher education. But, you know, with her mom's current state, she feels like she has to kind of take on this mantle of caregiver and would feel like she would betray her mother if she went on to do anything for herself. Corey also kind of wants to act cool and tough and kind of nonchalant for her mom's current apprentice, uh, this young woman by the name of Nell, that Corey has a romantic interest in. And I will actually tell you all about Nell in the next segment here, but just know for now that Nell also uh, is interested in Corey romantically as well, but they're kind of have this uh, will they, won't they dynamic going on. They're uh, Corey and Nell, they're dorks. I love them. But yeah, that's Corey Gory. She's she uh, tries to act cool and tough, but uh, she's got some worries on her mind that she uh, tries to keep hidden under a veneer of I don't care about it attitude. Okay, so you know how a few seconds ago, how I mentioned I would talk about the character Nell in the next segment? Well, here we are in that next segment. So Nell time, let's go. It's time to introduce you all to the reluctant witch, Prunella Sherry, though everyone just calls her Nell. Coming from a long line of well-known and respected magic users, Nell is currently enrolled at the East of Sun, West of Moon University of Arcane Arts, with part of her classes involving her taking on a apprenticeship under a vocal mage, this case being Corey's mother, who is also a witch. With all Nell's academic responsibilities, you know, she has to maintain her, you know, top percentage GPA. She's working on her student thesis. She's got her apprenticeship going on. She just ha has this 
constant overwhelming pressure that she needs to live up to the standards that her family's name has held on to for generations at this point. And because of that, she has ended up prioritizing her academic pursuits and the idea that she needs to live up to this idealized version of what she is supposed to be as, op as opposed to her actual wants and her actual dreams. You know, even sacrificing her own like social life for the most part. It's like that diagram you would see where it's like a triangle and it's labeled like good grades, sleep, social life, in reference to like college. Well, Nell picked good grades and sleep. With At this point in time, the only really connection she has outside of, you know, people she sees at her school is her family, who she doesn't live near. They're kind of long distance, so she sends letters to them. But Corey's mom, who I don't have a name for yet, you know, the witch she's apprenticing under, kind of like a mentor relationship, but also Corey, who she's kind of interested in romantically, but it's kind of like a will they, won't they. Nell kind of wants to prioritize her academic magic stuff. And even though she wants to, you know, spend time with Corey, she's like, oh, I really like you, but I'm sorry, I got to do all this stuff. Corey's like, oh, it's okay, I understand. I, I got I have my job to do too, so yeah. I totally, I totally get it. Anyways, they're dorks. I love them, they're dorks. And now, you know, outside of all this, she does have a hobby though. But it's a hobby that she's so afraid of her parents finding out about because it's her actual passion in life. And that is restoration. Specifically, you know, like repairing all sorts of old and broken items, especially books. She loves book restoration. She's absolutely fascinated by it. If she could, she would dedicate her life to it and make her living off of it. But she's so scared of her family's disapproval and being seen as a failure, she'd rather just hide it and go for a life she doesn't want, hoping for the approval of her family and peers. And the tragic thing is, is that if she told her parents the truth about what she really wants to do in life, they would be super supporting and understanding of her decision. She just legitimately has a really nice family. She's just, bless her heart, she has that much anxiety. It, it holds her back that much from doing what she actually wants. Now to quickly bring up Nell's fairy tale inspirations, the main one is, well, Prunella. A story about a young girl who is uh, kidnapped by a witch and forced to work for her. But the witch's son helps her escape and they live happily ever after. Except Kuri's mom absolutely did not kidnap Nell. It's a very willing apprenticeship Nell is under. <laughs> and instead of the witch having a son, it's a butch daughter with Kori. So yeah, that's the other fairy tale inspiration I was mentioning with Kori is, you know, the witch's kid from Prunella. And Prunella is kind of like a fairy tale archetype that I didn't realize was a thing is like the Rapunzel type story. So Rapunzel, if you remember the fairy tale of Rapunzel, she was named after a lettuce because, you know, Rapunzel's mom, you know, in the original fairy tale was eaten like the neighborhood witches, like vegetables. It's like, I'm going to steal your kid and you're going to name her Rapunzel after the vegetable you ate, you jerk. So there's actually a surprising amount of stories where it's like, there's this girl, she's named after a fruit or like vegetable or some type of plant that she or like her mom eats. And then she gets kidnapped by like some evil witch or in the case of a version of the fairy tale, let's see if I can say this right. Prezi Molin is an ogress that kidnaps a, a baby. So ogress, ogre with Cory and her mom. You, you see the connections I'm kind of making there, hopefully. So yeah, that's Nell, and I hope you liked her, because I like her a lot, and I think out of a lot of characters, I've definitely given her my quirks. I've definitely given her a lot of my quirks. So here we are, folks, the final character in today's video, and that is Julius, or as I like to call him sometimes, the Funny Clown Man. Now, if his name or appearance looks familiar to you, especially if you've seen any other videos of mine, I'll say this, folks, don't worry about it. 
just don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. It's don't, don't worry about it. It's all good. It's all good. And okay, if you remember from the intro segment about me talking about how like some of the characters are almost like a decade rolled, this is that character. Julius, if I remember correctly, I made him in September of 2014, which absolutely blows my mind that time has gone by so quickly since then. And just like me, he's changed a lot since 2014. He, I remember when I first made him, he was this very kind of skinny, edgy elf guy. And as you can see from his modern design, very different direction he went in. Though I think in some ways his personality is still very much just the same, being this very enigmatic yet cheerful fellow. This is also a case of an OC of mine getting a bit of a touch-up design-wise, as his previous design up until this point uh, was not bad. I always wanted him to kind of stand out from the rest of the cast of Thunder Puppet with his like bright, cheerful clown colors. His previous iteration was definitely a bit too intense. So yeah, and this uh, new outfit of his toned down the colors and also gave him, I think, a bit more aesthetically appropriate outfit with kind of the era I'm going for with like the Art Deco 1920s, 1930s vibe. So what uh, is his deal exactly? What fairy tale character or trope is he based on? And I'm, I'm gonna admit this, folks, uh, I can't really say because that's spoilers, but trust me, it's there. You know what? Put in the, the comments down below what you think it is, and um, yeah, I'll, I'll give you some other information about him <laughs> in, the, in the rest of the segment of his here. Just, but yeah, put, put in your comments down below what fairy tale character you think he is. So yeah, he's a clown, obviously, but specifically a street performer, doing the typical sleight of hand magic tricks and other like comedy acts clowns are associated with. But he also dabbles in a bit of fire breathing, which is very exciting. And he appears in the story of Thunder Puppet on like that first day when Damien, Corey, and Raph are like running around trying to get all these animals wrangled. Uh, you know, we're causing havoc. And Damien runs into Julius during one of Julius's acts on the street ends up ending his performance early. Damien views the event as interfering with his duties and Julius is mad because this guy just interrupted his job. So there's some animosity between the two there coming, you know, from both parties. <laughs> but they go their separate ways. Or at least they try to, because throughout the whole day, they just keep bumping and running into each other. And Damien thinks Julius is following him, trying to get, like, payback for ending his show early. And Julius is like, no, I am not following you. I don't want to be near you because I think you're an asshole. You're the one who's following me. And they just discover that for whatever goddamn reason, they just, coincidence or whatever, they just keep running into each other. And then kind of throughout the couple days that this story takes place, uh, the two kind of develop this friendship, especially kind of on Damien's part as he gets this strong feeling, strong feeling that he knows Julius from somewhere. They've met before. He just can't remember. One could say that the two uh, quickly form a bromance. A bromance without the because personality-wise, Julius is a man who uh, always has a smile on his face, whether it's a full grin or a knowing smirk. Honestly, I don't think it's physically possible for him to frown. And because of that, it is sometimes uh, hard to read his intentions. Like I said earlier, he definitely has that uh, enigmatic air about him. But he's not malicious. Snarky and sarcastic at times, yes, but not malicious. He is definitely a master of hiding a lot of his emotions and once behind his uh, smile. And yeah, that's pretty much all I can say for uh, Julius, uh, everyone's favorite clown man. Well, he's my favorite clown man. So yeah, with all of that, here we are, into the video once again. It's a cycle, it's cyclical. 
we're at the end again. <laughs> I really hope uh, you liked this. It was a bit different, and I think I've gotten a little bit rambly here and there, especially since this is a project that, that, that does mean a lot to me. So if you liked it, I really appreciate it, whether you like fairy tales or not. I hope you got something out of it. If you did, let me know in the comments. I always love uh, reading what you all have to write. Till next time, stay safe and to be kind to one another. Bye bye.